using this, I'm not sure I'm using it correctly. You look pretty far away. Turn it around. Turn it around. Oh yes! <laughs> Perfect! You look very close now. Thanks for your help. Here at the Faith Flight School Information Station, we gather information for your inspiration. And today, we'll be looking closer at the Word of God. And in our handbook today, we'll be learning about navigating the Word of God. Raise your hand if you love the Word of God. You do. I knew that. You know, the Word of God, it's wonderful. There's nothing more creative or transformative, more powerful than the Word of God. It's full of God's thoughts, and we need to know our way around the Bible. 
This Bible is precious, and it's full of his precious thoughts. Navigation. What is that? Well, to navigate to, means to know your way around. And we're going to help you with that today. We're going to have a sea captain who knows his way around the waterways. What else needs to know how to navigate? What kind of person? Well, yes, that's right. A mom or a dad, they need to know how to navigate if they're on a road trip. Who else? A pilot? <laughs> of course. Pilots need to know how to uh, navigate the open skies. They need to know their way around. And even a pilot in the cockpit, he needs to know all of the buttons. Well, today, you're going to be learning all of the books of the Old Testament. You're going to know your way around. You'll know it like the back of your hand. Turn it around. Like the back of your hand. I'm excited, and I know you all, because today we'll be learning about navigating the Word of God. Hmm. <laughs> Boys and girls, it is offering time. I am so excited. Are you excited? Good. Let's turn in our manuals to 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. Now, can anyone tell me, is 2 Corinthians in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Yeah, that's right. It's in the New Testament. Awesome job. Okay, did you find it? Good, let's read together. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Boys and girls, that shows us so much about how God is really looking at our hearts when we give. It's not about the amount that you give, but it's the condition of your heart. Let's say you could give so much money, but if you give it with a grudging heart and you're just like, here's my offering, I have to give it, so here it is, I guess. Boys and girls, that doesn't mean anything to God. But we could give a small amount if we give it in faith with a cheerful, happy heart and we say, God, thank you, thank you that all of my needs are met and I get to be able to sow this and I am so grateful and happy and thank you, Lord, and here is my offering. Boys and girls, that means everything to God. It's really the condition of our hearts because when we give with a happy heart, that shows that we are in faith and that is so pleasing to God. So before you give, make sure you're checking your heart to see if you're giving with a grudging heart or if you're giving with a happy heart. Hey kids, it's, it's confession time. time. Okay, you ready? Come join us. I'm quick, I'm sharp, I'm bright, good looking, very rich, and a major blessing. Right. Okay, get your doers out. I'm a doer, I'm a doer, I'm a doer of the Word of God. We need our Bibles. Thank you. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. This, this is, is my Bible. Bible. It is the Word of God. It, it is, is the, the word, word of God. I am what God says I am. I, I am, am what God, God says, says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I can, I can do, do what, what God says, says I, can I can do. And I can be what God says I can be. And I, I can, can be, be what God says, says I can be. be. I am. I am the righteousness. The righteousness of God. Of God in Christ. In, in Christ. Christ. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. The Bible, it's our manual for life. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says this, 
All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and makes us to realize what is wrong in our life. It corrects us when we're wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. The Bible, my favorite book, it's full of God's thoughts. And as we read it, we learn how to please God. And when we learn to navigate this great big book, we'll be pleasing God a lot. Fact. Did you know that there are 66 books in this great big Bible? That is correct. Today, we'll be focusing on the Old Testament. Fact. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. That's right. And the first five books are known as... The Pentateuch. Can you say Pentateuch with me? Pentateuch. Great job. They're Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Fact. These books are referred to as the law because they contain laws and instructions given by God to Moses for the people of Israel. That is correct. The next 12 books are known as the historical books of Israel. And they are Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. What was that? Oh, they're telling you it's upside down. Oh, why? Thank you. <laughs> First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Fact: These history books span approximately 1,000 years and teach us important life lessons. So important, and I'm very thankful for every one of the books. The next five books are Job, Psalm, Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Fact. These are also known as the poetic books and contain many songs. And it's where we can learn a lot about trusting in God and his great wisdom. The next group of books, the prophets. For the most part, these books are in this group because it's the prophet that wrote them. Fact. Prophets are divided into two categories. The major prophets, which refers to the longer books, and the minor prophets, which are shorter in length, but just as important. Just as important. That is correct. You know, you'll be learning a lot about these books, and we're going to be talking about the first five books of the Bible, starting with... Genesis. Excellent. And... Fact. Genesis is referred to as the book of first because it tells us about many of the first things that happened. That includes creation, like the first man and woman. It also includes the first sin, the first murder, and the first offering. Lots of firsts. And we'll be learning these important things, and a very special guest is going to be helping us with navigating our Bibles. Oh, hello there, boys and girls. I am Captain Alistair Flintlock, master of the Seven Seas, and my fellow captain, Captain Tyler, has asked me to come here today to teach you about navigating. Do you know what navigating is, boys and girls? Navigating is finding your way to where you need to go. Now, when you're on the sea, when you're out on the ocean, there are no landmarks to look at. There's no land at all only a vast expanse of blue to look at. So how do you find your way? Well, as sailors, we use the stars. We use detailed charts. We use our state-of-the-art GPS navigation screens. But what will you use, boys and girls, to navigate through where you need to go in your life? That's cheating. But you knew, didn't you? That's right. The Bible, our manual here, is the best tool, the very best tool, to navigate to where you need to go in your life. Let me show you a scripture. In Psalms 119, verse 105, there are a lot of verses in Psalm 119, and they're all good. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That sure sounds like navigating to me. But before 
you learn to navigate your life using the Bible. You need to learn to navigate the Bible. There are a lot of good things in this book, but to find the one that applies to your situation, you have to know where you're going. Well, I've got good news for you, boys and girls. That's what we're talking about in this series. We're talking about how to navigate the Bible. You can hide the word in your heart so that when the situation comes up, you know right where to go. So, Captain Tyler has asked me to be your guide today to the book of Exodus. What's that? You're right. Exodus isn't the first book of the Bible, which is why, well, I get some things started, get some things prepared around here. I'm sending you over to the information station to learn about the book of Genesis. I'll see you in a bit. God so loved the world he gave his only son whoever believes it. oh hi i'm glad you're here i was just about to talk about the genesis timeline you know all of the things that happened in genesis actually happened they're not just stories they're not made up fables they're actual events and these things that i brought with me today are going to help us remember that timeline did you know that Genesis is the book of beginnings? And there are 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. Let's start with chapter 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's a story about creation. Not only did he make that, but he made me and you. He made Adam, and from Adam came Eve. Then, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, we find out what happened with them. They were instructed, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat of any of the other trees, but not that one. But what did they do? Well, they disobeyed God, and they had some help from a sneaky servant. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they fell. But God had a plan to redeem all of man. Then, in Genesis chapter 4, we find out about their kids. We find out about Cain and Abel and the offerings that they brought God. Did you know that Abel had a great offering? Yes, he brought his best. He brought Fluffy. He offered the first and the best to the Lord. Unlike Cain, Cain gave an offering that didn't mean much to him. And God was not pleased with his offering. Cain got jealous with Abel, and he slew, he killed his brother. It was not a good day. And then we find out in Genesis chapter 6 about Noah. Noah was instructed by God to build a very large boat, just like this one. And what happened? Well, he saved all of mankind because he obeyed God and the animals too. And then in chapter 13 of Genesis, we learn about the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. It was a place where man decided to build a tower high up into the heavens in order to do what they thought that they wanted to. But God confused their language. They confounded their language. And that's where all of our languages came from. Hence the word Babel. And in Genesis chapter 19, we find out about Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot was in that town, and it was not a good place. It was very evil, very wicked. But God delivered Lot out of that place. He's very merciful. He loves us very much. In Genesis chapter 21, we find out about the father of many nations, Abraham, and his wife, Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, they were a wonderful couple, and God made them a very special promise. He said that he would make their descendants like the stars in the sky, like the sand on the seashore. And he promised them a son, and his name was Isaac. And after many years, when they were as old enough to be grandparents, 
that son was born, Isaac. Isaac grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. And in Genesis chapter 2, chapter 22, Abraham was at a point in his life where God asked him to do something. He asked him to sacrifice Isaac. But Abraham trusted God. He believed God. And he knew that if God asked him to do it, he was able to raise him from the dead. And instead of him having to do that, God provided a ram in the thicket. And it was the sacrifice for man. He's so good. Then in Genesis chapter 26, Isaac sowed in a time of famine. You know, Isaac learned a lot of things by his father, Abraham. He learned how to live by faith. And it says that in famine, he sowed. And in the same year, he reaped a hundredfold. In Genesis chapter 26, uh, 25, it says that Esau and Jacob were born. Those were the kids of Isaac. Uh, Jacob and Esau, they were twins. Esau was like his brother, but much hairier. Very, very hairy. You could tell it on his arms. In fact, Jacob tried to disguise himself as Esau in order to inherit his blessing. Because Esau didn't think much of it. He sold it to him for a pot of porridge. He didn't value it very much. Hmm. Then, in Genesis chapter 37, we find out about one of Jacob's children, Joseph. Joseph was well-loved by his father, Jacob, and he gave him a coat of many colors. His brothers did not like that. So what did they do? They threw him in a pit. It was a poor decision. They shouldn't have done it. In fact, they went even further. They sold him into slavery, and he was in prison for many years. But even in the middle of that, God prospered Joseph. He blessed him because God was with him. You know, all of these things in the book of Genesis are amazing, and they're true, and they tell us things about God and how we should live and, and walk by faith. You know, now that you know where all of these stories and accounts are, you can go to them in your Bible. And I know that today we'll be learning more about navigating this great big book. Hey, it's Guy here. This is the Bible. It's a book, but it's so much more. This is life. It's truth. It's help when you need it. Use it for your health, for your finances, for your schoolwork. It'll turn your uh-ohs into let's goes. It'll turn your why me into I'm free. The Bible doesn't just change your life. It changes you. This book was written by men of God. It was inspired by His Spirit. There's more here than you'll ever know. Just open it up and bam, new light, new understanding every single day. You need it. You read it. You grow. You grow. You get more out of it. Talk about value. But wait, there's more. This book doesn't just show you how to live your life. It shows you what life you should live. God made you and he knows all about you, but you need to know about him. You need to know who he really is and what he is like, what pleases him. Don't just take some guy's word for it. Isn't my name guy? Yeah. Well, anyway, let God speak to you through his word. Without it, you don't know what you're doing. Plus, it's a sword, and we all know swords are pretty sweet. So what do you get when you read God's Word, when you navigate through it? You see all the promises of God written down for your use. You get faith-building examples from great men and women of God. You get answers to life's most important questions. Most importantly, God becomes real to you like He's never been before. The more you get into it, the more you read it, the more you live in this Word, the more God becomes real to you. No fear, no sickness, no condemnation, just love, joy, peace. The list goes on and on. Have you heard of lifetime guarantees? That's nothing. This is the only book anywhere with an eternal life guarantee. 
God's word is true yesterday, it's true today, and it will be true forever. That's a long time, but you don't have time to spare, so don't wait. Open up the Bible today and navigate through it and find light for your path today. Don't go into battle without your sword. Open it, navigate today. Are you ready to come with me as we go through all the major events of the second book of the Bible? I knew you would be. Now we've got a lot of ground to cover. So make sure you are paying attention because along the way there will be clues for you to notice and I will be listening for your input as we go along. All right, come with me. The book of Exodus begins in the land of Egypt. The children of Israel had been there for quite some time. Do you know what was going on with them then? Well, it's time for our first clue. Look at this picture. Hmm, handcuffs. What could that mean? Well, does it mean that the children of Israel had been arrested? Kind of. The children of Israel had been in Egypt for 400 years, and in that time, the Egyptians had enslaved them. That means that they made them do all of their work and would not let them leave. The children of Israel were longing to be free. So, where do we go from here, boys and girls? There's supposed to be a clue somewhere in this room. What's that? Oh, looks like we have some furry friends here. A bear and a lion and a cute little monkey. All right. So that's a clue, is it? They're tied up. Oh, the bear and the lion are tied up, aren't they? What could that mean? The children of Israel were in captivity and they wanted to be free. What's that? I should untie them. I should set them free. That's a pretty smart idea, boys and girls. I knew you had the mind of Christ. Let me see here, get you untied. Ah, that does not feel better. All right, and uh, look what I found in his hands. It's a clue. Let's try the beard. Rubber band, but that was uncomfortable. All right, there you go. All right, burning. Bush. Burning bush. I suppose we should look for burning bush. Let's go. Well, somehow we've managed to wander all the way out of Egypt to Mount Horeb. So where's this burning bush we're looking for? Hmm? Where? Behind me. Oh, would you look at that? Well, let's get closer and see what we can learn. Moses, Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to, from that land to a good land, a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people the children of Israel out of Egypt. Wow. So the Lord spoke to Moses through the burning bush and told him to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But Pharaoh, when he got there, didn't want to let the people go. The Lord sent plagues against the Egyptians because Pharaoh would not let God's people go. The plagues 
were terrible. Do you remember what they were? Well, let's go over them in order, one by one. This way. Ah, it sure is hot here in Egypt, boys and girls. But it's about to get a lot worse because there are 10 plagues on the way. Give me a second. Oh, that's right. Plague number one, all the waters turned to blood. <laughs> that's a big problem. But from there, plague number two just... <laughs> plague number two... Oh, just... What is the... Oh! Frogs! They were frogs. They were everywhere. That was plague number two. Frogs everywhere you looked. All right, and after that, there were... There were lice. Everybody was getting bitten and scratching, and then the... And the flies came. That was number four. And after that, the livestock died. Number five. Number six. Everyone got painful, oozing boils. That doesn't sound fun to me, boys and girls. And then there was a great hail that came to destroy the crops and send everybody running inside. And then a swarm of locusts overruns the land and eats whatever's left. Boys and girls, after that, that's right, it got very, very dark. No one could see where they were going. <laughs> now I can't see where I am. Let's turn the lights back on. But even when Pharaoh couldn't find his way to his kitchen in the morning, he still refused to let the children of Israel go. So it was then that the tenth and final and the worst plague of them all came to the Egyptians. The firstborn of every household perished. Pharaoh had no choice but to let the people of Israel go. But as soon as they were out of his sight, he changed his mind and sent his armies chasing after them all the way to the Red Sea. The Lord did a great and mighty miracle and split the Red Sea so that the children of Israel were able to walk across on dry land. And then the sea collapsed in and swallowed the Egyptian armies, leaving no one to chase them as they headed into the wilderness. Let's go. When the Israelites had been wandering for some, for some time in the wilderness, I tripped over a, a rock there. Everyone, look out where you're putting your rocks in the wilderness. Um, they ran out of water. And that's a very bad thing to run out of water. But the Lord did a mighty miracle. Moses struck a rock with his rod and waters poured forth enough for all of the Israelites. So, we're looking for a clue here in the wilderness. What do you think we should look for? The rock? Well, that's because Moses struck the rock. You're very smart. I don't know if anyone tells you that enough, but you're very smart. All right. So this is a rock and uh, and there's a secret compartment in it. All right, what's this? Ah, oh. look at this boys and girls. The code is the key. The code is the key with a zero, zero, zero. Don't know why it's spelled like that, but if you need a key, maybe it's to the box in the next puzzle. I've got a picture here, and see if you can find a box. You did it! I never doubted you. I knew you'd find the box. Now just to get it open. It's quite stuck on there. It's a Oh, it looks like you need a code to get in. A code. Do you remember the clue we got? That's right. It said, the code is the key. The code is the key. The code. Oh. Zero. Zero, zero, zero. Boys and girls, you are so clever. I know you're doing your confessions about having the mind of Christ. Oh, and what's this? 
It's a riddle. It says, a law set in stone, yet written by hand, but the hand that was writing wasn't a man's. What could that mean? A law set in stone, yet written by hand, but the hand that was writing wasn't a man's. Set in stone and writing. You'll have to help me here, boys and girls. That's... You got it! That has to be it, that's right. It's the Ten Commandments. After that is when Moses was given the Ten Commandments. A law set in stone, but written by God's own hand. Very clever. <laughs> After that was when the children of Israel built the tabernacle where the Lord's presence dwelt with them. Well, boys and girls, that's it. That's the whole book of Exodus, books, chapters 1 to 40. I sure had fun. I hope you did too. Oh, I know you did too. Thank you for coming with me to navigate the Bible. Hope to see you again. Hi, Faith Life Kids. Today we are going to make a very cool craft, and I'm very excited, and I hope you are too. We are going to be making a telescope. So here's what you're going to need. You'll need an empty paper towel roll, a sheet of cardstock, some tape, then some markers or crayons or colored pencils, and then I have washi tape and some stickers for some extra decoration. Now we're making a telescope. You know what a telescope is used for? Yeah, that's right. It helps us to navigate. It helps us to see things that are really far away in a way that's bigger and more clear. So sailors on boats, they might look over on the horizon and through their telescope, and then they'll be able to see what's up ahead. Kind of reminds me of how we've been learning about navigating in our Bibles. So I hope that reminds you of that too. And when you look at your telescope, you can think, oh yeah, I remember all those cool things that I learned about navigating my Bible. So what we're gonna wanna do is decorate our cardstock. And this can look however you want it to look. Just draw the prettiest picture you can. All right. So when you're done decorating your cardstock, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the pretty side down on the table and we're gonna get that paper towel roll. We're gonna line it up with the edge and carefully roll it over. Then we're gonna get some tape and you might need to ask for some help holding all of this together before you can tape it and that's totally fine. Great, once you get it taped down, then we have a telescope. <gasps> Whoa! Huh! Boys and girls, I hope you had so much fun making this craft with me. Go so enjoy all the things you can see, and remember, this is to remind us to uh, how we've been learning about navigating in our Bibles. Okay, I think that this one comes next. Okay, is it Isaiah? Hmm. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, hi. I'm just working on the books of the Old Testament. Oh, well, that looks fun. Well, it really is, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of books to learn. Oh, it's not that many. It's only 39 books. You know, that's not that many. Oh, no. And we know a song that we could sing for you to help you learn them. Oh, that'd be great. Hey, kids, you want to learn too? I'm sure they do. The Old Testament has lots and lots of books. Some people get nervous just by the way it looks. But hold on.
relax and take it slow. There's only 39 books to memorize. So come on now, let's go! Man, this is a good song. We'll start at the very top. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, Ruth, 1 2 Samuel, 1 2 Kings, 1 2 Chronicles. There you go. Well, here, here we go. go. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, and Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Yeah, we're halfway there. We're actually oh, we're there. The Old Testament has lots and lots of books. Some people get nervous. <laughs> Not me. Just by the way it looks, but hold on. You relax and take it slow. There's only 17 left to memorize. So don't stop now. Let's go. I think that's a good idea. Let's keep going. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, and Joel. Yeah. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Man, I like that guy. The Old Testament has lots and lots of books. Some people get nervous. <laughs> Just by the way it looks, but hold on. Relax and take it slow. There's only 39 books to memorize. And you did it! Woohoo! Wow! Thanks, guys. <laughs> Hi, kids. If you haven't asked Jesus to be Lord of your life before, then we're about to do it right now. It's the best decision you'll ever make in your life. All right, let's close our eyes and just repeat after me. Father, I believe in you. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again and is alive right now. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. That's it, you're saved. Jesus is in your heart forever. You can talk to him and he'll talk to you. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua and Judges. <laughs> I've got it. I'm learning to get around in my Bible. How about you? And that's exactly what we've learned today. We've learned about navigating the Word of God. And when you've navigated the Word of God, you get some of God's promises. You start thinking His thoughts. And those thoughts are going to change you. It'll change you forever. Those thoughts are going to lead you to the answer for every situation. And when you do what the Word of God says, when you're a doer of the Word of God, you will be blessed. Thank you for joining us today as we've learned about navigating the Word of God. We'll see you next week.